All right. <clears throat> Have you guys ever had any encounters with uh, any famous people or celebrities? Like real life encounters with anybody famous? Real life encounters. Yeah. Do um, share. She was a singer in the Concrete Blondes. Concrete Blondes? Never heard of yeah, that one. She's really quiet, but. Oh, scary. My dad says her horses. Oh, all right. Cool. In California. Okay. I met Josh Rosenthal. I don't know if anybody knows him. Just like Christian worship um, guy. Yeah. Oh. Salt Lake. Cool. I don't know. Are you, are you just doing this? No. Okay. <laughs> I, thought you, I thought you had something really famous. Uh, anybody yeah, I, else? I met a stunt devil that was in the movie The Pacifier of Vin Diesel. Did you say stunt <laughs> devil or stunt the devil? Devil. Okay. <laughs> oh, not devil. Maybe, maybe close. No, it's not devil because he actually he, he did a lot of the, the he was uh, one of the jet ski drivers in the whole really? thing. Yeah, so he was I guess it's not devil, not a devil. Cool. There was there was I think the most unique guy's story that from, from that question was some guy met the the guy that, whose silhouette is on the MLB logo. Oh, whoa. It's like the most famous, not famous person that you'd ever know of, right? Because nobody knows his name, but they know his shape. Well, one time, uh, my family was on vacation in Colorado, and we were we were driving around outside in the, in the country on this little dirt road, um, somewhere outside of a little town that was outside of Colorado Springs, I think. And uh, I'm from Oklahoma. At the time, we lived in Oklahoma, so we had Oklahoma tags. And uh, my dad went to school and worked at Oklahoma State University, so he had this this logo tag on the front of the in front of the van at Oklahoma State University. And uh, it just so happens, have you, ever, have you guys ever heard of Garth Brooks? You know who Garth Brooks is at all? He's a really famous like 90s country musician, but he's making a comeback. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. Back? Yeah. Uh, anyway, Garth Brooks was really like really famous. When when he was making music, he was like he was the top of country music famousness. Yeah. And uh, well he went to school, he's from Oklahoma and he went to college at Oklahoma State, right? So we're, we're on this dirt road, and we're driving, and we went to go uh, turn at this three-way, uh, like a, a, a T intersection, and we passed this, this little Jeep, and it was in the middle of summer, so the Jeep had all the, the top off, and you could see the people that were in the Jeep really well, and as we like turned where they were going, they turned where we were going, the guy who was driving the Jeep like waved at us really big, and like, pointed at the, front of our, at the front of our van, and like, gave us a thumbs up and waved. My parents drove by, and they're like, that looked like Garth Brooks. That's so weird. Like you, you see Garth Brooks at this random intersection, and, and he was like waving us down because he noticed the Oklahoma State University sign. And we found out later that he was actually Garth Brooks was actually doing a concert in Colorado Springs. So again, most likely it was Garth Brooks that we saw. I mean, we could prove it because we could stop and talk to him or chase him down because that would have been really weird. But <laughs> pretty sure it was Garth Brooks. Another time, my my wife actually who. Uh, was when she was younger, did a lot of uh, work in remodeling houses with her, her dad. They had a, a business, they did that together. And uh, have you guys ever heard of the show Extreme Makeover Home Edition? Oh. They're the host of that show, Ty uh, Pennington, I think is his name. Well, she did that for a living, you know, and so she knew who Ty Pennington was. Well, they were going, she and her, and her dad were going to Dallas to a real estate seminar, and uh, they were, they were in the airport in Dallas, and she turns around, and this other guy turns around and almost knocks her over, like runs into her, like had to catch her to keep from knocking her over, and it was Ty Pennington. And of course, he was in a big hurry, and she, he just kept on going, and she was like, Anyway, kind of a cool encounter with a famous person. Anyway, we're, we're talking today, our, the name of, our, of this class is Mistaken Identity, and uh, we're going to be talking about how... We can think somebody is one thing. We think we saw Garth Brooks, but really we might actually be mistaken. We don't always maybe have the exact facts. We can think somebody, ourselves in particular, is one thing, but really we're wrong. And we can be really certain as to that person's identity or our identity, but if we're not careful, we really need to be careful that we're not mistaken. Okay, that's what our, our class is about today. So I have this game for you. Um, I, uh, I made it up. And I, I'm going to turn my computer around here so you can see. I don't have a TV or anything. So you're gonna have to, you, you can scoot forward if you need to. 
but uh, get where you can uh, you can see the screen. Sorry, I thought I already had this pulled up. Alright, this game is called Celebrity Doppelgangers. Have you guys ever, you know what a doppelganger is? Anybody, anybody know like what a doppelganger is? A twin, but it's yeah. not. A twin, right? Somebody who looks just like somebody else, but it's not actually them. Right? That's what a doppelganger is. So, this is going to be Celebrity Doppelgangers. And uh, the way this works is I'm going to flash somebody's face on the screen, and it's not going to be on there for very long, okay? And I want you, as soon as you see it and you recognize it, I want you to say that person's name, right? Pretty simple, right? Okay. All right. You guys ready? Everybody see? Yes. Not really. Not really? Okay, no. I'm sorry. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Here we go. Barack Obama. Barack Obama. You say that was Barack Obama, or is this Barack Obama? Because these two individuals look a lot alike. Yeah. <sighs> kind of crazy. All right, here's another. This, this, uh, this is a, the actor. Okay, so think actor. Uh, you know who that was? No. Look familiar? No. Want to see him again? Oh, I know. Okay, yeah. Here he is. Charlie Chaplin. No. He's, he's like in movies nowadays. His name's Nicholas Cage. Oh, oh, so yes. 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 But this actually is Nicholas Cage. This is sort of some random dude from the 1800s that looks identical to Nicholas Cage. Okay. Kind of interesting, right? Yeah. And, and kind of creepy. It's okay. okay, this next one is uh, an actress. Okay, so tell me who this is. Is it a. Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts. But was that Julia Roberts, or is this the real Julia Roberts? What do you guys think? Yeah. It, was, it was actually this one. You can tell he has a better quality photo. But look how close they look, right? If you saw this lady walking down the street, you probably think it was Julie Roberts. Alright, this next one's really good. Another actor. Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp. But actually, this is Johnny Depp. And this is just some dude that dresses up like Johnny Depp. I wonder how many autographs he's been asked for. <laughs> um, you guys, there's a, a show where they, they impersonate a lot of uh, famous people. And this is Tina Fey dressed up like Sarah Palin. You guys remember that time? No. no. <laughs> Tina Fey, sure. Okay. No, she was the, the governor of Alaska for a while and kind of ran for president, I think, for a little bit. But anyway, uh, you guys know who these guys are? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, what's this? Tom, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Oh. Dave Matthews. Uh, they look really similar. <laughs> This next one's really funny. Yeah, it's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Will, Will, yeah, the guy who plays Elf, Will Ferrell, <laughs> and uh, and the drummer from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, the guys that played uh, in the, the Super Bowl. Yeah, look really close to the same. They've actually made movie or, uh, videos of acting like each other. It's kind of funny. Anyway, so you can see how if you saw the guy that looked like Barack Obama walking down the street with a bunch of dudes in suits and earpieces following him, you would probably be very certain that that was Barack Obama, right? Would you be correct? <laughs> no, that wasn't Barack Obama, right? He just looked like him. The same thing's true with our, with our, uh, our defining of what it means to be a Christian. Sometimes we, we think we're a Christian, we say we're a Christian, but we might be mistaken. What are some things that we use to uh, identify ourselves as Christians? What are some things that we really, truly use to identify ourselves as Christians that maybe we shouldn't? Because I have gotten the textbook answer of actions. And yeah, you're right, absolutely. We need to look at people's actions. And we need to look at our own actions and see if it matches up. But what do we really use to define what it means to be a Christian? What do you think? I think one of the most common things that we do is uh, we look at, at uh, people around us, right? Whether it be people in our youth group or people that we go to school with, especially people in the world, we look and say, well, I'm much more godly than the people that I'm around. So that makes me a Christian, right? That would be like saying, okay, over here you have, you have heaven, you have God, right? And on this side of the room you have, uh, you have evil, okay? And we're saying, I'm a Christian because I am more godly 
than this group of people, right? And I am. I'm closer to God than, than right here. Let me stay. We stay more godly than this group of worldly people. But as worldly people and people around us drift further and further away from God, where are we heading? And we're still just as just as uh, as much further away than these people, but we're heading the same route that they are, right? We can't use people around us to identify ourselves as, as Christians. It's not a biblical concept. Another another thing that we use to, to identify ourselves as Christians sometimes is is following a set of rules. Right? We say I'm a Christian because I, I don't cuss, and I don't drink, and I don't smoke, and uh, I don't go with the girls that do. Right? That's an old statement. Right? We have this, this list of rules, and we say, because I don't do all these things, that makes me a Christian. Again, that's not a very biblical concept. There's a group of people called the Pharisees. Have you guys heard of the Pharisees? Right? Jesus... Uh, referred to them as, as whitewashed tombs. Or he said, you know, you wash the outside of the cup in the dish. You follow all of these rules, but you've neglected what's really important. You, you wash the outside of the cup in the dish, but you don't wash the inside. You, you look like whitewashed tombs that are decorated and look right on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones. That's a, that's a pretty major uh, correction there. It's something I think we can, we can fall, be guilty of if we're not careful. Being a Christian is not about just just following a list of rules. This is another serious one that uh, I see all too often. We, we use the word Christian, and, and we define whether or not somebody's a Christian, whether I'm a Christian, based on denominational placement. What's a denomination? You guys know, are you familiar with that term? Kind of like what church you want. Yeah, right? Okay, so Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, this or that. Right? Those are denominations. That's what that word. That's not how we use the word. Um, and you'll you'll hear people tell you that that the Church of Christ is non-denominational. And what that means is Christ's Church, the group of people, the body that He died for and bought with His blood, is not a, about a denomination. It's a group of people, right? And that's right. But to denominate means to separate into groups and to give a name for each individual group so that they're separate. Right? Uh, Paul talked about this. I left my Bible right behind you, Jenny. Can you give me my Bible on the floor? Yeah, either one. Paul talked about this, uh, this concept of, of separating ourselves based on, on a name in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, in 1 Corinthians uh, 1, verse 12, he says, What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Paulus. Another, I follow Cephas, or Peter. And still another, I follow Christ. And what's interesting here is he, he gives all these names that these people were, were separating themselves based on. And he even includes the group that, that says they follow only Christ, along with the, the rest of the list, because they were separating themselves from their brothers and sisters based on a name. He includes them in the same list. He says, this is not this is not what we should be doing. Okay? If we think that you're a Christian just because the name on the, the, the building that you worship at, you, you need to look at, at what the Word says. Because that's not how we define what it means to be a Christian. Another thing that we, that we use, uh, I, I've been guilty of this. Um, the first time I was ever in a church building, I was like two days old. I was in a Church of Christ building in Oklahoma. I, I was raised in the church. You guys ever heard that expression before? How many of you would say you were raised in the church? Right? There you go. And we have this tendency to look at, at, at ourselves. And because our parents were Christians, and their, maybe their parents were Christian, however far back it goes, and, and ever since we were babies, our parents have brought us to church, and all we know is Sunday school and youth group. And we have this, this heritage, and, and this it's almost like a resume that we say, I'm a Christian because I, I am, and my family is, and, and I was born into it, and I just, I just am. That, that's not exactly right either. Paul, again, talks about this one in, uh, in Philippians. <laughs> he says, if, if, you, if you think you have a resume, you're mistaken. He says, look at, check out my resume. And he, he gives his here in Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to back up to, or I was going to start at 4, but we'll back up to verse 2. 
Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. We, we, who, we who worship by the Spirit... Oh, I missed one. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I am more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Okay? You're not going to get a resume that's shinier than Paul's. Right? He says, I had the resume. You know what Paul calls that, that list of, of, uh, of things that, was, that would, people would look at and, and call good? In another passage, he calls it rubbish. I count everything but, but rubbish. And, and really, it's not just saying trash. What he really was saying was poop. Okay, Kind of a vulgar word for poop almost. He's saying it's crap. All this is, is worthless. And he says this is garbage and nastiness compared to Christ. Right? The things that we count and, and sometimes look at and say, I'm a Christian because of this, we really need to be careful and look at why we're saying we're a Christian. And we need to be certain that we're not mistaken. So, really and truly, the only, um, the only definition of what it means to be a Christian, or the measurement that we should look at, is what Jesus had to say, right? I mean, what I say as a Christian doesn't matter if it doesn't match up with what Jesus says it means to be a Christian. We're going to look at that. This is, uh, we're going to open to, if you have your Bibles, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 23, and then I'm going to skip over to 57. This is 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. And again in, in verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes and holes and birds of the air have nests. Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Does Jesus' sort of response to these, these three guys right here, they seem kind of harsh, you know? I mean, just be honest. Does it, does it seem like he's being a little harsh to these guys? Yeah? <laughs> it kind of does, right? I mean, one guy says, Jesus, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, really? Because I'm homeless. Are you okay with being homeless? <laughs> That's what he says in the first, to the first guy. And then the, the next guy, he says, follow me. And the guy says, okay, I'll follow you, Jesus. But first, let me go and bury my father. And that doesn't seem unreasonable, right? He's going to bury his dad. Really, what... It's, it's a little bit different meaning to us in our culture. To, in, in this culture, most likely his dad was still alive, and he was like his last living relative that he had a duty and obligation to look after until he was deceased. And then he would be free to go and follow Jesus, and that's what he's saying. Right? The last guy just wants to go say goodbye to his family. Does that, does that seem unreasonable? No, he wouldn't think that seemed unreasonable. And what does Jesus say? No one... Who puts his hand in the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom. I can talk about kind of serious and a little brutal, right? Really what this is getting at is, again, in, the, in their culture, if he left and, and followed Jesus without the consent from his family, without the blessing of his family, it would be like going against his family's will. And it would be a serious thing. I mean, it would be like the talk of his town that he did this crazy thing and it would be almost like a disgrace to his family. 
So in, in another passage, in Luke, Jesus says, if you're going to come after me, if anyone wishes to follow me, he must hate his mother and father, his brother and sister, even his own life. Now, is Jesus saying you have to hate your mima or your nana? Is that what he's getting at? He's saying, you have to hate them. Is that what he, is that what he means by that? Absolutely not. No. Because Jesus doesn't want to hate anybody. He's all about loving people, right? What he's saying is a similar thing to what he's saying here. He's saying, if you're going to follow me, I want your 100% wholehearted devotion. There should be nothing else, no one else in your life who even comes close to your devotion to Jesus. It would be like saying, uh, if, if there's a race on a racetrack, right? Or you guys are watching the Olympics right now, right? Mm -hmm. If there's a, a race in the Olympics, you say, I don't want to just come in first place in the race for your, for your life and your love and devotion. I want to be the only one in the race. There, should no be, there shouldn't be anyone else on the track. That's what he's getting at, right? <clears throat> You guys have been to church camps, right? It's, the camp is awesome. And it's a it's frequent place, it, it's a frequent place for, for people to decide to become a Christian, right? To become a follower of Jesus. But sadly, all too often, the what you see is, is people make a one-time decision to be a Christian, and then nothing comes after that. Have you ever been to a wedding? You guys ever been to a wedding? Is that going to weddings? They're kind of cool, right? You get to see two people that usually you know. <laughs> it's a little awkward if you don't know them, but uh, usually you know them and you love them and you care for them. And you get to come together and witness them exchange vows as to their devotion for one another. What are some, some typical things that you hear people say at weddings? Like, I'm going to be I'm committed to you for or uh, until, until death do us part. <laughs> um, or you, you hear him say, for, uh, for better or worse, or for richer or for poorer, or in my case, for poorer or for poorer. <laughs> and, and they devote themselves, and they say these vows, and it's, it's awesome. It's kind of mushy, good for you, and they kiss, and then they go off and, and be married. And what would happen if you heard or read on Facebook after you went to this wedding of this couple that you knew, and you read on Facebook that on their honeymoon, um, one of them was unfaithful. The wife was unfaithful to her husband. Well, I mean, what, would the, the one-time decision that they made, would that mean anything? It, it would be like the, their words would be meaningless, right? Because they didn't make a commitment to one another. When you get married to someone, you make a lifelong commitment to be devoted to them, right? That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's not a one-time decision that we just say, yeah, I'm good, I'll follow you. And then our life doesn't add up to it. Jesus says it's either 100% or don't bother that's what he's getting at in that passage in, in Luke. There's another verse in, in John chapter 3. You guys probably have heard this one before. Um, do you know who Nicodemus is? Heard the story of Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Uh, you guys we talked about before. Which meant he could have walked around on any given day. And, uh, and if Jesus had a crowd of people around him and he was teaching, Nicodemus could have walked right up next to Jesus and the crowd would have just gotten out of his way. Because, he was a because of who he was. He was an important religious leader. Right? And so he could have come up to Jesus at any time to have this conversation. But we read in, uh, in John chapter 3, in verse 2, it says, He came to Jesus at night and said... Now, why would he come to Jesus at night? So think? that nobody would see him. So nobody would see him? Well, since Jesus. So, well, Jesus would see him, so that, like, the rest of... Yeah, so you're right, so nobody would see him in particular, so the rest of his of the Pharisees wouldn't see him, right? Because he says, uh, it says, He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. So Nicodemus is like a closet fan of Jesus, right? He believes in Jesus. He, he's starting to kind of think Jesus is who he says he is. He's from God. But he doesn't want to let everybody know it, right? And so he comes to Jesus at night, and, uh, and he's kind of interested in finding out what it, a little bit more about this Jesus character, okay? And Jesus says to him in verse 3, he says, I tell you the truth, no one 
can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, the phrase born again, that probably doesn't sound weird to you, right? There's no shock factor when those words hit your ears. Because you've heard born again, right? We usually associate that with Christian, born again Christian, right? We've heard that again and again and again. But to Nicodemus, there was a little bit of shock factor when he heard the words must be born again. And he's like, what do you mean she's born again? What are you talking about? It sounded kind of crazy, a little weird. He's like, do I crawl back in my mother's womb to be, to be born again? That doesn't make any sense. What are you getting at here? It would be like, as, as, like the, the shock factor part of it would be like if, if somebody were to say to you, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you've got to kill yourself. Okay, so I say the words kill yourself, and now all of a sudden that has a little bit of a sting to it, right? And it's like, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? And it's a little bit more serious. That's kind of the response that Nicodemus would have had. And, and the, the meaning is the same. That if we want to follow Jesus, if we want to be a follower of Jesus, the life that we've lived up until the, the, that point is completely gone, right? We are no longer that person. Jesus says we must be born again. We are made somebody completely different. Right? Our identity is changed. That's, it, it's, a, it's the same kind of thing that we're talking about. A, a serious, wholehearted commitment. See, sometimes we use, uh, we use a, like a sliding scale of what it means to be a Christian. You know what a sliding scale would be? Like, like we have Christians that are like, they go to church twice a year. Easter and Christmas. They call themselves a Christian, right? Because they go to church those, that twice a year, they, they check that box, and, and that would be like this end of the sliding scale. And then you have Christians that go like, go to church once a month, maybe, right? They, they, they go to church once a month, they're Christians. Or then you have like uh, every Sunday kind of Christians, but they don't go to anything else. Just Sunday mornings, they're there, and they, they skip out pretty early. And then you have like uh, Sunday morning, Wednesday night Christians. And then you have Christians that are they're Sunday morning, Wednesday night, and they're involved in teaching classes. And then you have, you know, this or that. And you can go all the way up the scale to whatever you think is the, the highest calling of being a Christian. But don't we have a sliding scale? I mean, have you guys seen that before? I have. And it's not biblical. Jesus says there's no, there's no scale that you can choose to be this much committed or this much committed. He says it's all or nothing. Would you want to be married to somebody who says, I want to be committed to you, I'm going to be devoted to you till death do us part, and I want to see other people. I mean, what, do you want to be with that person? Not at all. That's what Jesus is getting at when he, when he told those people, let the dead bury their own dead. Your family will take care of themselves. Be committed to me or don't. It's wholehearted, all or nothing. There's, there's one last passage I want to, I want to read with you that's it's kind of a similar... Uh, stories from Matthew uh, chapter 19. Again, it's probably a familiar story. The rich young ruler. You've heard about the rich young ruler, maybe? The rich young man. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 19. We'll start at verse 16. Now, sometimes when people came to Jesus, it says people came to Jesus and asked him this question or that question, a lot of times... They were actually trying to like get Jesus to, to stumble over his answer and kind of get him in a trap, right? They were trying to trick Jesus. I don't think I don't think that's the case with this guy. When I read this story, I really believe that this young man that was asked, talking to Jesus here, I really believe that he he's meaning what he's saying and he really wants to know the answer to the question that he has to ask Jesus. I, I just get that impression. That's just my opinion. I think he's very sincere. <clears throat> Verse 16 says, Now a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man inquired. Jesus replied, Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Now, this is interesting because, I, again, I really think he was sincere here. He says, I've kept all of these rules. I've obeyed all these commandments and laws. And what's interesting is he still 
feels like there's something missing. He says, what do I lack? Why, why would he feel like there's something missing? Right? It's kind of an, an interesting concept. But Jesus knows what it is that's missing. And we can tell by his response here. And he gets right at the heart of the matter with this, with this young man as to what it is that's missing in his life. And he doesn't like the, the answer that we'll find out. In verse 21, Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Great wealth is not something that we would think would make us sad, right? <laughs> We usually think quite the opposite. And it's ironic because it's the thing that, that he thinks is making him happy, and that's why he's holding on to it, and really that's what's making him sad. Right? And what Jesus gets at here is, it, it, this man's great wealth for him was the one part in his life that he said was his, and that he was not willing to give up to Jesus. Right? There's nothing wrong with, with having wealth, okay? That's not the point of this. What's wrong is when we try to withhold some part of our life from Jesus. Right? It would be like saying, okay, Jesus, I'm going to, I'm going to go to all the youth rallies. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to, I'm going to be a good person in school. But when it comes to my career, I'm going to get the career I want to get. So don't ask me to go to Africa and be a missionary because my career is important. Or it would be like saying, okay, Jesus, I'm... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a leader in my youth group. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray before my meals. I'm going to watch what I say and be kind to others and obey my parents. But when it comes to my relationship with my girlfriend and my boyfriend, we love each other and we're going to sleep together. So don't ask me to give that up because that's mine. You can't have this part of me. This is mine. Jesus says, if you're going to be a Christian, it's 100% wholehearted commitment forget everything else in your past. Because in reality, it's, it's gone. It's dead. You're a new person. And you're wholeheartedly, 100% committed to Him. I, I hope you guys think about that concept. And that that might challenge your idea of what it really means to be a Christian. Are, is your definition of Christian for yourself, is it something that is different from Jesus' definition? Because if so, then your identity as a Christian might just be something that you're mistaken about. Hopefully you can think about those things. We're going to discuss them a little bit more. Uh, but before we do that, let's, uh, let's have a prayer. I want you guys to. Father, thank you for this weekend that we've had to, uh, to come be strengthened by one another, to build relationships, to worship and praise you and for the instruction that, that we're receiving this weekend, the challenges that we have before us. God, as we look at what it really means to, to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, help us to, to take it seriously as to the, the commitment that you desire from us, the wholehearted commitment. Please, Father, forgive us when we fall short of this. And thank you for for the sacrifice of, of your son and the example of, of his life that we have. Help us as we try to, to live up to that example. We pray this in his holy name. Amen.